Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast featuring garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is February 25th. Today in Garden History, we celebrate the birthday of Anna Gilman Hill, the director of the Garden Club of America for six years between 1920 and 1926, and the assistant editor of the club's bulletin for many decades. Anna was born on this day, February 25th in 1872. Anna and her husband owned an estate in East Hampton that became quite famous. It was called Gray Gardens, and it was purchased by the American socialite Edith Bouvier Beale. Anna once wrote these words, Above all, in your absence, do not allow the children, the ignorant visitor, your husband, or your maiden aunt to play the hose on your poor, defenseless plants. Great advice. And it was on this day in 1943 that George Harrison was born. He's the English musician and singer-songwriter and the lead guitarist of the Beatles. He was born on this day, February 25th in 1943. George's original song compositions include While My Guitar Gently Weeps and Here Comes the Sun. Sometimes George is referred to as the quiet beetle. He did relish his life out of the spotlight, and he once said, I'm not really a career person. I'm a gardener, basically. Sometimes I feel like I'm actually on the wrong planet. It's great when I'm in my garden, But the minute I go out the gate, I think, what the hell am I doing here? And it was on this day in 1989 that the Age New Paper out of Melbourne, Australia, ran a story about a brand new play that was written by Suzanne Spunner called Edna for the Garden. And as you might have guessed, the play was all about the charismatic Australian gardener, designer, conservationist, and writer, Edna Walling. During her lifetime, her garden design clients would say to their friends, you must have Edna for the garden. And that familiar saying is what inspired the name of the play, Edna for the Garden. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Secret Gardeners by Victoria Summerlee. This book came out in late 2017, and the subtitle is Britain's Creatives Reveal Their Private Sanctuaries. This book features the private gardens, the secret gardens of some of Britain's most famous artists. In all, 25 gardens are featured in this drop-dead gorgeous book. You'll see the gardens of Andrew Lloyd Webber, Anish Kapoor, Jeremy Irons, Kath Kidston, Ozzy Osbourne, Sting, Julian Fellows, and Rupert Everett, just to name a few. Now, for the most part, these private sanctuaries, these great spaces, are not for public consumption. So without Victoria and Hugo's book, these gardens would remain hidden. They would remain secret gardens. But thankfully and generously, they all agreed to be part of this incredible book. Now, in the introduction, Victoria reveals how she and Hugo have connected with these beautiful spaces. And Victoria and Hugo have done a couple of great books together. They wrote The Secret Gardens of the Cotswolds in 2015. And then in 2019, they wrote Great Gardens of London. And I have them both, and they're wonderful, wonderful books. Now, what I really got a kick out of in the foreword to this book is that Victoria tells us just how she and Hugo are able to line up seeing and photographing and then writing about these incredible gardens. And so here's what she wrote. She writes, when planning this book, 
Hugo Ritson Thomas and I did not set out to feature famous people who had a lovely garden. Our original concept was a book on artist gardens, looking at how those who had some training or background in the visual arts organize their outdoor spaces. Great idea. We were all very enthusiastic about the idea, but then realized that it might have a broader appeal if we included people who were involved in performance arts as well. I'm often asked how I choose the garden for my books, and the answer is that I don't. Hugo does. I have a power of veto, but Hugo is the one who persuades people to open their gates and let us in. How he does this, I have no idea. I am firmly of the belief that Hugo could persuade St. Peter to open the gates of heaven if our publisher decided to commission a book on the Garden of Eden. Isn't that a funny story? Well, Hugo and Victoria do make a lovely garden book team. Hugo's indelible images transport us to these wonderful spaces, and they also give all of these books amazing covers. And Victoria helps us appreciate these gardens on a much deeper level than we otherwise would without her lovely commentary. So when you pick up a Victoria Summerlee Hugo Ritson Thomas book, you know it's going to be beautiful. You know that the gardens will be world class. And you know that you're buying a book that is not for the bookshelf. I always say that to someone if I give them one of these books, because these books are way too pretty for that. They're too pretty to be on the bookshelf. These are books, and this is a book that is set out so that when you walk by, you're tempted to stop and read it. Or when someone visits your home, they see that beautiful book and they fall in love. This book is 272 pages of gorgeous, sublime, unforgettable, imaginative secret gardens that are sure to knock your socks off. You can get a copy of Secret Gardeners by Victoria Summerlee and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $30. All right, we're going to end today's show with a botanic spark that features Olive Mary Edmondson Harrison. She was born on this day, February 25th in 1881, and she was a British horticulturist. In 1898, Olive was the top student at Swanley Horticultural College, and she placed first on her exams with 285 points. By rights, she should have earned a spot at the RHS Garden in Chiswick, 5,000 pounds and a scholarship. But Olive was born just a bit too early because the RHS declined to recognize Olive's accomplishment since they were still an all-male institution. Now, in looking at the test scores, and anyone can look up these test scores, you can see that women made up 10 of the top 25 test scores back in 1898. So by my calculation, two Marys, three Ethels, one Jessie, a Lillian, a Eunice, and an Ada would not have been able to work at the RHS either. Olive's story was uncovered by a researcher at the RHS Lindley Library, and then it was picked up by the BBC, and that media attention led to a connection with Olive's descendants, and they confirmed that Olive had a lifelong love of gardening, and it was great to hear about. Well, you might be wondering what happened to Olive. After her exam, she did eventually find work as a gardener. In 1901, she ended up working for the Cadbury family. The Cadburys loved their gardens and Easter. But once Olive got married in 1904, she stayed home to raise her family. Olive died in Seattle. She'd gone to live near her daughter back in 1972. 
Well, that's it for today's show. Just remember that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.